When I started advising pest control companies back in 2003, Run to Kill North America was a $20 million business. Fast forward to 2023, and the company has now eclipsed over $2 billion in revenue in North American pest control alone. In addition, over the years, rent has created billions of dollars in shareholder value, and most recently executed the largest M&A transaction in the space. But this wasn't an accident, though. This was all executed under the leadership of Andy Ransom, a CEO who likes to keep it simple and execute. 2023 is a special year for Andy. Not only did he just complete the Terminex acquisition, but this year will be his 10th anniversary as the CEO of a FTSE 100 company. Now the FTSE 100 is the top 100 publicly traded companies in the United Kingdom. And most of those CEOs last maybe five years, but this year Andy's making it to 10. As I stand here on the coast of Puerto Rico, I think back to the conversations that I've had with Andy over the years, and they are by far the most interesting and entertaining. And I think about getting back. You know what, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm going to London. journey when did you get in i got on on friday andy and it's official now after i don't know a few dozen stops in london over the years i'm now a crime statistic i was mugged <laughs> you were mugged get get away i came out of a posh restaurant picked up my phone as soon as i put it to my ear three punks came one of them grabbed it and ran there weren't three really it was just one yeah it was <laughs> you're already embellishing this Look, story i know you are <laughs> no nick my phone as it were and um wow. it took me you know I was with a buddy as soon as the, the phone disappeared, you know, it's a race to try to turn this thing off. Yeah. And the thieves weren't particularly sophisticated. The first thing they did was order a 24 pound order of Krispy Kreme on Uber <laughs> Eats. I just can't make this up. They did spend 20,000 pounds within the first 15 minutes at the Apple store wow. before everything was wow. shut off. And, you know, I'm still dealing with the aftermath now, but I went over to the Apple store on Regent Street. Yeah. No, Got well. a new phone, and the guy was just like, listen, you know, it. we see this a dozen times a day in front Why? of this store. And he said, you know, you know, somebody steals from you, you can't do anything because you become the assailant. Yeah, well, that is true, yeah. yeah. But honestly, I, it, it's a safe city. Anyone watching, <laughs> it's, it's, it's <laughs> never happens. That's it's, never happened to me. No? Wow, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Wow. It's just, sorry to interrupt, can yeah. I get you anything to drink? What would we like? I think it's been a long day. I'm gonna start with a coffee. Yeah, I'll get a cappuccino, please. Cappuccino? Just black black coffee. Any sugars? Not for no. me, thanks. And some sparkling water if I can get one too. Sparkling? Yeah, please, yeah. Magic. Be right yes, over. Thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, no, I've never, uh, London's always been a safe city. I've never had an issue. A, a German friend of mine says, don't wear a watch, don't, you know, hide your money. And no. he didn't warn me about the phone though. No, no, it's a safe city. Yeah. You just got unlucky. I did get unlucky, for sure. Which makes me think of, you know, you at Renico, you guys are always talking about safety, right? Yeah. Now, after this happened, I thought about, in North America, I can literally think of dozens of companies where the owners and technicians have concealed carry permits to carry firearms. Wow. I would imagine Renico North America doesn't allow technicians to pack heat. I don't think that's in the company policy, Paul. No, no. Yeah, we're certainly good at killing killing things, but but not uh, not that way. No. no. So when you're talking about safety, you're more concerned yeah. with falling off the roof or those sorts of things. Well, for me, say, I, I, I'm passionate about safety, I know and for a very very 
good reason. So years, years ago, I, I, my company, I, I worked for a chemical company and the business that I ran was in explosives. And explosives are a dangerous thing. And, and so when I took over the business, I said, right, safety is going to be the most important thing and we're going to have no incidents at all on my watch. Mm -hmm. And we did. We had a, an incident, um, a father and a son working side by side, and there was an explosion and one of them died. And that had a, an incredibly profound impact on me as a, as a, as a manager, as a leader. And, and, you know, I'd started with this, you know, no one's going to die on, our, on my watch. This is, just isn't going to happen. Yeah. We're going to have a perfect safety record and then this horrific incident. So it really had a huge impact on me. So whatever job I've been doing, wherever I've been, whatever business, I've always, always majored on safety. And, I, and I'm proud to say at Rentica, we've got an incredibly good safety record. But as they will say, one accident is still one too many. So every single meeting in the company, every single meeting in the company, board meeting, management meeting, branch meeting, site meeting, starts with safety, every single one. And, and you know, it, I'm incredibly passionate about it, but because of that horrific incident about 30 years ago. Well, you know, from an acquisition side, you guys are the only acquirer in the industry that every time we're doing a deal, you send folks out to do safety audits. Yeah. You're looking at signage, you're looking at the equipment they have, you're looking at the shoes. You guys come in, you issue all yeah. these brand new company shoes to folks. Yeah. Well, the reason for that is I've, I've long since held the view that if you show me a company that takes safety seriously and has got a great safety record. I'll show you a successful company. Very rarely do I see, you know, companies that are great at safety and they're not very good at anything else. But plenty of times I see companies that don't take safety seriously. Well, what else are you not taking seriously? It's about the most important it's a quarter thing. Down, right? Yeah, it absolutely is. You know, we want everyone to go home safe at the end of every day. So it is. It's one of those sort of little um, litmus tests. You know, that, what is, what's the safety standards like? So, um, and that's one of the great things, but I'm sure we'll talk about Terminex in a bit, but I, I had wondered, well, I wonder what their safety record's gonna be like, and we did a lot of due diligence, and the great thing is their safety standards are right up there with ours. So that, that was a real reassuring moment for me when we, when we got to that moment, see, wow, they're, they're as good as rent to kill and we take it so seriously. So yeah, no, number one for me every time, safety. You know, one of the things you and I have never really chatted about is back I want to say it was 2007 or so. I, I was not even 30 yet. I decided that I was going to try to raise some money. You guys had bought Ehrlich in North America, and I saw pest control is an interesting business. I'm a young kid. I decide, okay, I'm going to track down Alan Brown. I'm going to send him a letter. So I said, hey, dear Alan, you know, I'm in the process of trying to raise private equity funds. I'd love to buy Running Kill North America. Dropped it in the post, went over to the UK. I was in the US at the time. And here we are, gents. I've got your cappuccino. Lovely. Thank you very much. My pleasure. There's your Americano. And the sparkling water, yeah? Wonderful. Perfect. Thank you, sir. No worries. And what I imagine happened is Alan probably tracked you down and said, hey, we're starting to make noise and get noticed. The US, American crackpots are writing us letters. Handed you my letter. And you, you sent me a nice letter that says, dear Paul, thank you for your interest. Cheers, guys. Enjoy. Thank you. Run to Kill North America is not for sale. It's core yeah. to our business. But hey, by the way, if you happen to find anything interesting for us, we're happy to take a look at it. And back in those days, you were the corp dev guy. Yeah, that's right. So you were doing what I guess Chris, Chris Hunt's doing today. Back, back in those days, probably much. Uh, I, I, I was going to resist the temptation. <laughs> no, so say I, it, say I was it. doing it, but better. No, I was, I was doing better. it differently. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> absolutely it right. Um, <laughs> so take me back, though. I remember you were at, what was it, ICR? Is that the name? ICI. ICI. So, yeah. so we're, you got your start as an MA attorney. Take well, me I back. suppose I'll, I'll go back, if you want to go, if you want to go back to the ancient history of, you know, my. my I'd like to go back to a five year old Andy Ransom. Five-year-old Andy Ransom. I'm not sure I can remember that, but I'll, I'll do my best. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, I, I was brought up in a tiny little village, about 500 people in the village. Um, my dad was the village postman. Oh. Uh, my parents didn't own their own home, didn't even own a car, actually. So I went to this tiny little village school, then I went to secondary school, which wasn't very good, and then I moved uh, to a different part of the UK where I went to another school, which was even worse than the first one. So I had a, I had a you know, reasonably 
Uh, it was a lovely upbringing, a yeah. wonderful upbringing, but but a pretty uh, down to unremarkable, earth unremarkable, and, and then and, and schooling was was equally unremarkable. You know, I, I was going to leave school at sixteen. I hadn't done particularly well, and I was, I'd got a job, and I was going to leave. And then one day, I discovered that all my friends were staying on um, to to do the sixth form, as we call it, mm -hmm. um, and and I thought, well, I, I don't want to be left behind, so I went back to school. Um, finished up and I did really well. And then I went to university, studied law, and I did well doing that. And then I became a lawyer, um, started in a London law firm, and then I joined this big chemical company. And one thing rolled um, into another, and I suppose my time at ICI, I mean, I was, I'm a deal guy, I'm an M&A transaction lawyer, and I did that for years and years and years. What I found, though, was that for me, I was a decent lawyer, but I wasn't a great lawyer. But I was good at the transaction side. I loved, I loved the negotiation. I loved the deal. You still do. I still do. Day. I still do. I'm an absolute deal junkie. I, I can't get enough of that. And then on this one fateful occasion, um, I was walking down the office one afternoon and, and um, uh, I saw the fax machine going. You remember a fax machine? Oh, okay. uh, the fax was coming through and, and, and I picked up the fax off, off the fax machine and I read it and, oh my God. Um, we were being sued. My company, chemical company, was being sued. And Johnny Cochran, who had just won the O.J. Simpson case, yep. was suing my company for billions. What the hell? What was this all about? And it was all in relation to um, the Oklahoma City bombing. 168 people were killed in that incident, yep. the biggest terrorist incident on U.S. soil um, at that time. And McVeigh and Nichols, if you remember, they were the guys who planted the bomb and caused this explosion. But they'd used our chemicals, um, they'd used our fertilizer chemicals. The ammonium nitrate. The ammonium nitrate to create the bomb. And Johnny Cochran brought this, this multi-billion dollar lawsuit. And even though it's good, you know, I'm a, I wasn't a litigation lawyer, I wasn't an American attorney, I looked at that and I said, you know, I, I just want to be, uh, I, I want to defend this. I want to, I, I, this is outrageous. I want to do this. You so, never thought and said, stopped and said, well, maybe I'm not the right guy to do this based on my experience. Well, yeah, I'm sure I did. I'm sure I did for you know, uh, uh, many, many t occasions. I probably thought I shouldn't be doing this, but it was important to me. And it, and, and it was, yeah. So I went to my boss and I said, look, I, I want to defend this. And he made all the arguments, you know, why it wasn't a good idea. But I moved the family to Canada. We lived in Canada for a few years, moved to America. And I spent five years defending the company against what was an outrageous uh, lawsuit. And so that sort of took me away from mainstream deal making. It took me into a different world. I ended up running um, part of the business when I was in America, came back. Um, I became head of M&A and then as these things happen, you know, after a wonderful 20 year history of doing all sorts of things in the company, we were taken over Yep. and that was the sort of, well, okay, what do I want to do? Do I want to be a deal guy? Do I want to be an attorney? Do I want to be commercial? And there were five of us running ICI at the time and three of us um, sort of got together and said, well, maybe we could continue working together as a team. and. One thing led to another, and this rent kill thing, well, no idea what this is about. This came along, yep. and three of us came into, into the company. So I guess I got lucky, because when I came into rent to kill um, they gave me all the stuff they knew I could do, the deal stuff and the legal stuff, and they started to give me, they, I, and my colleagues started to give me some other responsibilities. And about a year in, I got pest control as the business to run. And instantly I knew what a special business, what a special industry that was. And so it's sort of, it's quite gradual my move from deal making and corporate development and legal and, and uh, all of that history to I just landed in the right place. And it was such a, such a different business from what I'd been used to. That was about coming up with product and selling great product. This was all about people. And that was, that was the minute I knew, wow, that I found my, natural home. This was, this was a, a real light bulb moment for me, a very different type of business. Well, you know, look, Renekil was a very different business then than it was today. When you came on board, I think that was around the time of the CityLink troubles, right? Uh, yeah, bank. <coughs> Excuse me, good coffee. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was the uh, back end of the CityLink uh, parcel carrier. Yeah. 
loss making business, losing fifty million pounds a year. I think it was. You, didn't you guys sell it for like one pound and an assumption of debt or something like we, that? Well, we sold it for one pound and we never got paid the pound. Okay. So uh, you know, I got a long memory. You didn't hire debt collectors for that. <laughs> no, no. no, no. <laughs> so, so when you see, so you came on kind of in the mid two thousands. Um, I mean. Could you have imagined back then, you know, obviously Rana Kills a very different business now, but you know, if you think about the Andy Ransom that was doing Corp Dev and a variety of other things versus where you are now at the helm of what's one of the largest service organizations on the planet, really. Um, I mean, did you imagine that you and your team could potentially take Rana Kill to such scale? I, it's a difficult one to answer because, you know, did I, did I actually sit there and envisage that that's what we'd go on to do. No. But would I have thought there's any reason we couldn't do it? No, no. I didn't. I, you know, what, what was really clear was that the pest industry is an incredible industry and rent kill had a fabulous position within that. And, mm -hmm. and it had pockets of brilliance and then pockets that hadn't really been looked at and, and nurtured for many years. It hadn't really had the investment in technology. It hadn't really had the investment in innovation. But at its core was this kernel of brilliant people, passionate people that had been in the industry for years. And, and so there was definitely really good raw material to work with. I think, you know, uh, I'm not saying we, we, we invented density, but once we really sat and modelled density and how do you create dense networks. That was a real light bulb moment to say, well, okay, that means we can do lots of incremental bolts on m and They don't have to be national, international. They don't have to be big. If, we're a, if it's a good quality business, could that enhance the density in a town or, in, or a city and really add to the profitability? And that was a real moment. Once you realise that, and you had the basic raw materials of good people, good position, good brand, and then you could make those investments in technology and in, and in innovation. Well, that became the reality. That became you know what the plan was, the the, the right way plan, as we call it. Is that around the time? I mean, in prior years, obviously there was CityLink, there was these big hygiene businesses. Renekill was not a majority pest control company when you mm. came on board. Not at all. Did you guys look at the portfolio and say, well, wait a second? Pest control's highest margin, high visibility on cash flow, capital light, we need to focus on there. Thought through the density thing. When was the active decision made to say, you know what, let's become a world-class pest control organization? We did a, a little exercise and it, and it was Bain, based on Bain Consulting's um, their, their four box grid. I think mm -hmm. they came up with it in the 1950s. So this is not really, you know. Oh, cash cow. No, all that, exactly, all great. of that. So, I mean, you know, I, one of the first jobs I, I was given was, was to come up with a strategy for the, for the company. And, I'd not really done a lot of strategy work before, but I thought, well, I know where I'll Find Johnny Cochran and... Uh... <laughs> exactly, I've been too busy doing other things. But I took the, the Bain four box grid and exactly, we sort of worked out, well, which are the businesses we shouldn't be in here at all? Which are the businesses that are low margin, low growth, and really haven't got any great potential? And that was, they're the ones we need to get out of. Yeah. Which are the ones that actually have got all the right raw materials and, and pest, as you say, you know, good level of growth, good uh, margin, the ability to roll up into something yeah. much, much bigger, um, the ability to make a step change in investment in technology and innovation. So that we put in the top, in the top right. Um, and then hygiene, which, which you know, if we had more time, we could, we, could, we could talk a lot about in hygiene. Hygiene is actually as good as pest control. I've heard you almost say hygiene's the new pest control, I, right? I, you you just just have said that <laughs> because it, 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 it's growing as quickly, its margins are slightly higher, um, uh, uh, its customer retention rate is even higher. So you've actually got the same, It's again, it's a density play. So it was quite clear the businesses we should deprioritize and then it was quite clear the ones we should. Yep. Now the question then, I was I was I could bore for Britain on this subject. It isn't about the strategy and it isn't about the plan. It's about execution. Yes. And and anyone who's ever worked with me or you know hung around me long enough knows that that's what I major on. A half decent plan that you execute the living daylights out of will always give you better results than the perfect plan. So it really is about execution and and making sure that you deliver on the commitments you've set out to deliver. So 
I can go back and I can look now for a decade of, of three-year plans. Where do we think we're going to be in the next three years? And then roll it forward another year, yeah. roll it forward another year. I think we've beaten the plan every year over that 10 years. That's not trying to sound conceited. It's, it's trying to make the point that if you execute the plan, good things happen. But for me, the whole, you know, the magic sauce, and this is, you know, this is how I feel, but I also know it's how the pest industry feels. For me, the whole model is about people. It starts and finishes with people. So the technology's good and the brand's good and what you do on the yeah. web's good and innovation and all of that's good. Somebody asked me, I was on stage on one of our events and there was a comedian there and he was, he was um, trying to have a bit of fun with me, which was, which was fine. I was in, 330 Germans and a German stand-up comedian asking me questions and then translating the answers oh boy. into German. It was, it was a half the audience were really enjoying it, the other half were cringing like yeah. that. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, but he said, you're a CEO. He said, it's not even a job. What do you even do? You know, what? And I thought, well, this is a bit awkward. You know, yeah. what do I do? What, <laughs> I know. what is the job? And I came up with this terribly lame answer. Lame, but sort of true. Okay. I said, I'll tell you what my job is. I got to get 58,000 people out of bed every morning. I got to get them to work. I got to get them to do an amazing job for their customers. I got to get them to do it safely. I got to get supervision. Without supervision on their own, I got to get them to do it happily. Then I got to get them home again in the hope that they come back to work the next day. And it was a it was a really lame answer. But in that little anecdote is the kernel of what I think the business is all about. If you can find good people, uh, engage with them, inspire them, get them, give them good training, encourage them to develop their careers with you, stay with you longer, mm -hmm. good things happen. And that's the, that's the key to, to execution in a, in a pest business and a root-based business. So that's really what I've majored on. If, if anything else about the last 10 years, you know, what do I think I've done well or haven't done so well? I would say working on culture, working on people, has been the most important thing that I, I think that we've done at rent to kill and, and I'm very, very proud of what we've achieved there. We don't just talk the talk. I mean, you guys have won so many, you know, best workplaces awards, which is really quite surprising. It's a pest control company. Like, how can it be such a great place to work? So what are some of the things that you, you know, what are some of the initiatives that you guys have done over the years to really make sure you're putting your colleagues first? I came up with this thing. I didn't come up with it. I, I, when I worked in America, I, in my old company, I had a project called Employer of Choice. And I thought, well, I quite like the sound of that, Employer yeah. of Choice. So that means people want to come and work for us. Mm -hmm. So we sat down and did a lot of work with our colleagues and said, well, why do people want to come and work? Why do they want to stay? What is it about the job and what is it about pest control? What is it about rent kill that caused people to want to stay? So we put a whole program. It's less about initiatives and it's, it's about creating this this culture and this, this nice place to work. I mean, people say to me, what's it like at rent -Kill? And I always say the same thing. You know, it's a really nice company. Yeah. It's nice people. Nice is very much underrated. So we're trying to create this warm, um, collegiate environment, supportive environment that we help each other. Uh, and that goes an awful long way. But there's a very hard edge side to it as well. We measure a lot of things. We, I can tell you we've got 2,000 branches around the world. I can tell you, well, don't ask me, but the, so you, you'll test me out, but <laughs> every single branch around the world, how many vacancies we've got in each branch, in each role, how many people have applied for, for that job, how many days has it taken to fill that, mm -hmm. and we track that. We've been tracking that for years. So you can see trends in any city in the world, so you can actually see is there a problem in the Shanghai branch? Or is, or is no, it's always been challenging. It's the same in the Bay Area of San Fran. So the combination of, of a supportive culture where we, we spend a lot of time, effort, money on training, we promote from within, we really try not to hire from the street, we promote yeah. every time there's a vacancy, promote from within. But also uh, we track and we trace you know, KPIs over a long period of time so we can see, are we improving? We've invested a huge amount in training, frontline training, management training, and that's really, really, you know, so we're investing in people. Um, it's, it's, those are the things that we've done. I mean, you, you said yeah. quite rightly, we've won awards. We won, yeah. um, indeed, we won the award for the best employer in the United Kingdom, and Apple came second. 
um, you were in the Apple Store uh, yeah, you know, over the weekend, and you see you down. It's like, how does pest control? It, it, it's really by working on that on that culture. We're trying to be a good, supportive, nice place to work. I hear it a lot. I mean, last time I, a couple months ago, I was having a, a beer with Chris, and I said, why don't you leave, you know, the UK is cold, it's dreary, well, it's high today. taxes. Why don't you leave that place, go to the call, pay no taxes, make more money. You got another run in you, and he said, you know, run and is really a lovely place to work. I just couldn't see myself anywhere You're else. You're trying to tap up my people. I just was, you know, I'm steady now. <laughs> I like to test the waters just to see what's going on. Um, but yeah, and one of the nice things, you know, and, and again, it's back to execution. If I look at my team, the global team around me, yep. there's an awful lot of longevity. There's a, people have tended to build their careers here, and they've they've tended not to move on. Now you can argue that you know sometimes they should leave. You know, one or two times you'd say well, it'd be good if somebody moved because then it allows someone else to come through. But if you've got a business and you're trying to do as we are, a consistent execution model, having people that have been doing it for a number of years, and you see this typically in the industry, people who stay in the industry, is really, really helpful for that execution. So having people that um, have been with us 10 years and know what they're doing, they don't need to be, they don't need a lot of interventions, yeah. makes, certainly makes my job an awful lot easier, but it also means the, the reliability of that execution is so much higher. Maybe you lose a bit the margins because you've not got the latest thinking from you know somebody joining from outside the industry, but I, I, I do think that counts for a lot. Well, I think that's a great case study in juxtaposing Renekin with Terminex, right? There was a lot of new people all the time from outside the industry with a bunch of brilliant ideas every 18 months. When I think about Renekin North America, you know, you hire John Myers. He's He's been at the switch now for how many years? I think 14. Okay. 14, 15, 14 and a half. Came so, out. Did you hire John? Or yeah. Or, or, yeah. Okay. Was, yeah. Yeah. You came out a year before he did. Yeah. That's right. So you hired John. You know, when I look at what Renekill has done um, versus like an anti CMX, anti CMX, I think, um, made an error, and this is my opinion, in the North American mar market by putting a suite, sending a suite over. A brilliant guy, but mm. very culturally different. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of foreign companies, you know, a lot of American companies make that mistake, sending Americans over and vice versa. But was that a specific decision to hire an American to run an American business, or did it just work out that way? Because I think it just worked out that way. I mean, it, it, John, John was the right person at the right time, but it was interesting when, you know, 14 years ago, our revenue in North America would have been. Couple of hundred million, yeah, two hundred, something like that, two fifty maybe. Uh, and I think you know we've grown, John's grown, the business has grown, and but the management team uh, has has grown tremendously as well. And I, I, I'm not a big student of, of business. I don't read a lot of business school stuff, but but I do remember reading years and years ago Jack Welsh, GE, and he said the the key to being a successful leader is to surround yourself with people who are better than you and then get out of their way and let them get on with it. And that's more or less what he said. Uh, and that's really my management philosophy. So my, you mentioned Alan, my predecessor. Alan was a bit more central command and control. I'm a little bit more uh, laissez-faire. I don't think people would recognize that description of me, but I don't try and do John's job for him. Um, I hold John to account, and then John's, John surrounds himself with, you know, a great team. And that team has evolved over the years as well as the business has got bigger. And then, you know, with the wonderful merger with Terminix, we've now got an even bigger, more impressive North America team. So no, we didn't we didn't set out and say right, you know, we need an American because it's America. But I, I think he's the right person and has done a super job over the last 14 years. I mean, I've worked in, in Canada and, you know, and America, and they, they got used to the accent. They, they figured it out eventually. So. Yeah. Speaking of the Terminex acquisition, at what point in time did you make the decision in your mind, I'm doing this? I first looked at um, Terminex over a decade ago when they were owned by CDNR. Mm -hmm. I went to New York. Um, I can't remember the year exactly, but I went to see CGNR um, and I took a look at it. We, we couldn't afford it and, and CGNR wanted to do the float in any event, but it was the first time I looked at it. 
Um, I, I see it as part of my job to know what the competition is doing. So it wasn't just Terminex we were looking at, but we, I've looked at Terminex many times over the last 10 years and tracked them very carefully. Known most of the senior management over there from one time or another. Yeah. A few months into Brett's tenure, that really was quite a, a, a green light for me because my biggest worry, when you put two big, big businesses together, there's two reasons why big mergers go wrong. Mm -hmm. One is cultural misalignment yeah. and the other is poor execution. So I didn't know Terminex well enough um, to know whether the cultural alignment would be as it needed to be. Uh, and I knew Nick, and I liked Nick, and uh, I knew him over the years, but I wasn't sure what the culture under Nick was. Yep. Um, but I started picking up intel, rumours, whatever, um, that under Brett, it sounded like we were, you know, we were drinking from the same, yep. you know, fountain or whatever. He uses different terminology to me. He talks about servant leadership without knowing it. That's always been my model as well. Mm -hmm. So I started to hear things, in one sense, good things about Terminix, in another sense, worrying things because I kept thinking, well, if 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 they execute, are they are they finally waking up? <laughs> they, then they're yeah. gonna, you know, they, yeah. they'll get away from us. Um, and so I really liked what I heard uh, about uh, Brett and the team that he'd put together. Um, so I suppose, yeah, it was, it was you know, a few months into Brett's um, tenure that I started to say, OK, you know, there have been discussions in the yeah. past. So I, I knew a lot about the company, but the bit I didn't know was how that culture um, fit would go. And that's been fantastic. So, so that was for me was the bigger thing I needed to understand. Were were we, um, you know, coming from the same? We've both yeah. been around 97, 98 years. Yeah. The, the companies have got very similar history. But was there a was there a danger of a big misalignment? And once I got comfortable, no, actually, quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. The culture fit has been astonishingly good. Um, and a lot of that is to the 100 year history, but a lot of it's also for the last couple of years what Brett and his team have been trying to do. So I suppose, you know, that's when I really started looking um, in earnest again. And I, you know, of course, it was COVID, it was uh, the yeah. pandemic and, and we couldn't we couldn't meet. We're doing it all through videos. And um, eventually I said, well, we, we're going to have to meet here. And, and, and the United States of America wouldn't let me in. Um, so we had to meet up in Toronto. Uh, in an airport hangar somewhere. Um, so that was that was when we met. So that was you know, eighteen, yeah, well, two years ago now. Yeah. So. Under Brett, he really focused on retention of employees. Yeah. And there was the kind of the Terminex turnaround playbook where he wasn't going to go out and just buy a bunch of stuff and do what folks in the past had done. I mean, is is, is Brett's playbook still in play now? as part of Renekill with the Terminix organization? It is, yeah, it is. I mean, it's one of the, the, the neat things about the, the merger, arguably the neatest thing, is, because, you know, being a deal guy and having done a lot of merger type activity in my time, quite often the financial case for the merger is made out of, of synergies and savings. It's all about, you know, how many heads can you cut? Yeah. This was different. This was Terminix with the leading brand residential and termite brand in North America with a big position in resi and a big position in termite. And then, then here's Rentacill, who's got the leading global position in commercial with a big brand in commercial. So you've got this incredibly complementary fit. And as we've gone into it in the, you know, bringing the businesses together, Brett's position has been, hey, you know, we're not going to try and tell you we think we know how to do commercial better than Rentacill. Let's just take the Rentacill playbook and we'll adopt that. Yep. And we've, to a greater or lesser extent, we've taken a very similar position with, with Resi and Termite. I mean, Termite, we were always small in. Mm -hmm. And Resi, it's only in America we're big in Resi. Outside of the United States, we do some Resi here in Australia and a few other, but, yeah. but it's not as big a market. We've always been the commercial uh, outfit. So by playing to each other's strengths and, and letting um, the natural leader lead the playbook, as you put it. Yeah, absolutely. So the answer is yes, we're working very hard. And then we, we're trying to do best of breed. We're trying to say, yeah, but have we got some stuff that we do that's better? Yeah, well, let's bring that in and have, have um, they got some stuff. So we're, we're sort of trying to make sure we, we mesh the best of both. But um, 
Uh, the Terminix playbook under Brett is absolutely what we're implementing. I can imagine that, you know, you mentioned the brand. I mean, clearly in North America, Run Kill has, for over a decade now, been an amalgamation of a variety of local brands. Yeah. Of course, Run to Kill, the name is not nearly as known in North America as Orkin and Terminix. So I, I got to imagine that the brand was an important aspect of this acquisition for you guys. Yeah, look, for me, it comes back to what I was saying earlier, philosophy. It, it was about people. And so you, you mentioned colleague retention. If I had a single thing that caused me to worry about putting the two organizations together, and I'd get asked this all the time by investors, you know, what keeps you awake at night? What, what are you concerned about? Colleague retention is the single one that I would, I would put up there because back to my terrible story about a German comedian, you know, if you can't get people out of bed in the morning come to work or if, or if you can get them to come to work and then they leave you again in the next six months, mm -hmm. that's a really difficult hand to play yep. and no matter what industry you're in. So that for me was, was really where my focus was, much less about brand and all the other things and synergies. That I knew that would be good and the, and the question was, could we together, could we address that and make that better? And, and I'm feeling you know, really, really good about that. So the brand was, yeah, it's a wonderful brand. It's got the best you know, brand recognition in pest control uh, of any brand in, in the United States. So, um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's a wonderful, it's a power brand as we call it. How has the folks out in the field, the frontline colleagues, Dealt with this over recent months during the, the integration. I mean, have, have you had any retention issues? Anyone, you know, waves of exodus because I don't like Renekill or I don't like Terminex or? No. Um, it is funny, though. It's a funny old industry, isn't it? Because I suppose <laughs> all industries are the same. I, I had some. Oh, one of the investors was about three, four months ago saying, oh, we hear people are, people are leaving the company. And they went, well, where are you hearing that? And, oh, well, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're hearing it. We're hearing it. And, that's what we're, and I, I tracked it down and, and, you know, it was like six people, yeah, and yeah, six people that we've invited, you know, made available to the market, as they say. No, it's been good. It's been, it's been really good. So colleague retention is up. Um, in both businesses, and that takes some saying. So frontline colleague retention has improved. Needs to improve further, um, but that's improved. Management retention's great. Obviously, we, we, you do have to make changes when you bring big businesses together. So some people have had to leave the company. Some of that has been voluntary. Most of it's been voluntary, um, but, but nothing out of the usual. So no, I'm actually delighted with where we are in colleague retention, but it's still one of the biggest opportunities to get the overall frontline colleague retention across the combined business up to the sort of levels that we want it to be, I would say is, is, is probably the single most important focus for me over the yeah. next couple of years. How have you dealt with you know, the harmonization of comp structures across? You know, Carefully is the answer. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, where we're at the moment is we've done a lot of work on the benefits piece. Uh, outside of America, people don't know what I'm talking about. And you all know what benefits are, but we don't you, you use different language over here. Mm -hmm. So with things like medical and dental, uh, yeah. things like paid time off, things like all of the, all the ancillary benefits, we've done a big piece of work and we've moved on that already. So we're well on the way to harmonizing benefits. We mentioned safety. We've done things like, I mean, they may seem like small things, but safety shoes. So rent -to kill colleagues had safety shoes, Terminix colleagues didn't. But of course, we're going to give everyone the same, the same with uh, bee suits and other equipment. So we've moved on those sort of uh, ancillary things. Pay plan is in scope. Um, but the answer to that question is ca carefully. You don't mess with yeah. pay plans in, in root based businesses and pest control without a lot of care and attention and thought. So we will be moving and we will we'll be moving to a single uh, pay plan, but we'll do it carefully. We've got a pilot going, we'll get through that, we'll learn from the pilot, we'll make some changes and we'll move. So, But we're on track for where we expected to be. We're not behind plan, but we're not rushing that. We've got to get that right. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you've got to take care with it. When you think about the fact that you guys own a huge chunk of North America now, you know, 
since the acquisition of Earth, and more acutely starting in around 2012, 2013, you guys have been on somewhat of an acquisition tear, particularly in North yeah. America, right? Yeah. And, you know, I would imagine. It's not been bad for you, Paul. No, it's been it? great. I, yeah. I, that's why after our coffee at the end of the day here, I'm buying you the pint this time around. <laughs> um, but I would, champagne, please. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you guys are going to be more selective, I would imagine, going forward in North America. Yeah, look, I think, um, as you say, we, we, we have been doing a lot of acquisition. We're not the only ones, of course. You know, our, yeah. our competitors have. Private equity's gotten very busy in, in that space. Um, but we've got a lot to do in the next two to three years. We've got a lot to do to integrate uh, across the, the, the two businesses. And that's going to keep us busy. Um, but we're pacing ourselves. We could rush this. We could say, right, I'm going to crash it together in 18, 24 months. I don't think that would be a good plan. So we're going to take 36 months to put them together. Now, at any one point in time, that may mean that certain different parts of the business are cup tied. You know, they're just going to be so busy on that that we really shouldn't give them something else to do, like integrate another yep. business. On the other hand, big chunks of the business will either already have been integrated or not yet slated for integration for another 12 months, which means we're going to have opportunities. Um, what I'm not going to allow to happen, um, if there's a must-have asset out there and, and it's an asset that we've prized for years and we've been working on it for years and we know, yeah. I'm not going to let that, I'm not going to miss out on that because once it's gone, it's gone. Um, but Unless if it's acquired by a financial sponsor, and then you get a financial shot. sponsor, in which case you know we'll make an appointment now and then come yeah. see us in three to five years' time, exactly. I guess. Um, but but if there are, and we all know that sometimes they're more sort of nice to have. Yeah, that's yeah. a good business, but it doesn't you know it doesn't tick all of the boxes. We'll probably pass on some of those in the towns or the cities where we're already incredibly busy. Must-have deals will do now. If the must-have deal comes right on top of an integration, we'll just, we'll just incubate it. We won't integrate it. We'll run it as a separate business for a couple of years, and then we'll come back and integrate it in a couple of years' time. So, um, look, and then the other thing, of course, is we're in 93 countries around the world, um, and 92 at the moment, there's some Terminex integration in a few markets, you know, Ireland, Sweden, Mexico, Honduras. But the vast majority of our, our markets, we're you know, totally open for doing acquisitions. So probably means we'll do a little bit more outside of the States, outside North America, and a little bit more in hygiene and well-being, um, while we're giving ourselves a little bit of space in, in the States. But, but as I say, I'm not going to miss any must-have deals in, in the US. But you're kind of running out of inventory, so to speak. I mean, there's a, a scarcity of premium <clears throat> assets now in the pest control space. I know they regenerate and all that, but between anti cmex and Rollins and Renekill and now the fin it's, you know, financial sponsor season, you know, there's not, you know, I have these conversations with Alex all the time about the fact that even in North America, you've got some old businesses, you've got some interesting ones, but you don't have the supply of quality assets that you once had just a few years ago. Well, I, yes and no. I mean, you know, I think you're, you're right. Certainly at the top end, and we all look at PCT 100, right? So at the top end of PCT 100, there's been an awful lot of activity mm -hmm. by definition. If you look at the bottom end of PCT 100, the smallest company in the PCT 100 is still significantly bigger than it was a few years ago. Correct. So it is, it is regenerating. Mm -hmm. And many of the smaller ones will go on to be medium-sized ones, and several of the medium-sized ones will go on to be great quality companies. The other thing that, that is worth remembering is the vast majority of, of companies that have come into the Rentcourt family, when they were trading on their own, were probably doing 10% um, operating margin. Yeah. Uh, and when they come into a, a network like ours or our big competitors, you still get a big opportunity to increase the margins just because of all the density factors. And, yeah. uh, and so they don't have to be you know, the biggest. They don't have to be operating at the top of the, the, the pile. They just have to be a good business with good people, good um, customer base. And so we can still, there's still plenty of runway. But I agree, you know, by definition, a lot of deals have been done that won't 
be available to be done. But there's still an awful lot. You've still got 18 to 20,000 pest control companies in the States, and that's after a decade of consolidation. So, so I'll continue to be. Busy. I think I think you're you know I think you're all right. If that was the purpose of your question, I think you're all right. For a few years. I just needed before. reassurance yeah, from no, you, Andy. You'll be all right. You'll be all right. Yeah. You know, since you've come on at Renekill. You guys have focused on innovation and technology, yeah. I think, more so than any other player in the space. And, I, and I'm not just talking about, you know, <laughs> tech-enabled pest control. I'm talking about, I mean, I remember back when we did the VDA deal, that yeah. was the Vector deal. Yeah. And I remember sitting with John and sitting with Alex, and we spent a couple of months going over it. And John didn't want to do that deal. You did. Mm. And it was a, you know, they got the scientists and the lab coats. They had very differentiated capabilities, and it put Run to Kill on the map as basically the larger, largest provider of vector disease control yeah. in the world. In addition to that, you know, most recently we did that deal in Israel. So, you know, we talked about gun rights. Let's talk about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So, you guys officially entered Israel by yeah. IPM Ronan's business, yeah. which. You know, I got to spend a lot of time over there looking at his AI-enabled, you know, optics and all the things. What is it with you and innovation and technology, and where, where do you ultimately see yourself taking this business over time? Uh, let me split that into two, because I, I think technology is not necessarily the same thing as innovation. So let's start with tech, yeah. all right? Um, I, I like to try and keep things simple, because I'm a, genuinely, I'm a simple guy. A small village. From all of that, exactly. Yeah, yeah. all of that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I've given you the sob story. We'll, we'll move on. But so I, I say simply to my team, why are we investing in technology? What's the, what's the reason why we're doing this? Keep it simple. We invest in technology for one of two things. We are either trying to make it more efficient, more effective, lower cost for us to provide the service to you. Mm -hmm. So anything that we can do in the back of house that doesn't negatively impact your service but can lower our cost to serve has got to be a good thing. And that's a, that's a margin play. More excitingly is any technology that we can use to give you, a the customer, a better service. If we can give you a better service, and ideally a service for which you value as a premium service, then that's even better. So if it doesn't meet one of those two criteria, we're not doing it. Unless it's, unless it's making us more efficient or it's giving us something neat and cool and innovative to sell to customers. On the innovation side, the thing with pest control, you know, it, it, it is a wonderful, I, I would say it's the original subscription business before subscription businesses got trendy. You know. It is the gift that keeps on giving. If you've got a contract with your customer, mm -hmm. if you deliver great service, if you keep them happy, keep them pest free, solve their problems, be easy to deal with, be nice, be transparent with your billing, um, then they should, they should be staying with you. Yep. They, really, they really should be. So um, now, that will only take you so far. The question is, well, okay, if you want to keep growing, for us, we think that the, the differential is innovation. Mm -hmm. Innovation is the lifeblood of organic growth. That's, that's our view. That's either... We're coming up with new things to solve existing problems, or we're coming up with new things to solve new problems. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that's our view. Now, increasingly, that is a, a lens that you've got to put over the business in, in terms of um, sustainability, yep. non-tox, chemical free, low energy consumption. Mm -hmm. You've got these big themes now that, again, if in my view is if you're not innovating, you're dead. Yep. And, and so, um, some of it is responding to what is happening in the big wide world. Some of it is trying to lead the industry. And we are now, you know, by far and away the biggest player in the industry. And, and with that comes a responsibility. And, and we think we've got to do some things differently in the industry um, and for the benefit of the industry. And some of that is to find new solutions which, which are um, less burdensome on the planet. So. For us, innovation, I will say innovation is not a, a, a product, or it's not a process, it's a state of mind. Innovation is, you know, are you open to new ways of working, new ideas, and whatever your job in the company is, are you open to that? In fact, we encourage you to innovate and then share it with the rest of us. And even when it's been a failure, please share it with us because we won't then copy it somewhere else because we know you've already tried it. So I think innovation really is very, very important. 
Um, you look at, you know, as you talk about the, the Israeli deal, and um, I was asked to do an interview with the Financial Times was about three weeks ago. I read the article. Well, they, they, yeah, but the interview was nothing to do with that. The interview, <laughs> the interview was all about M&A. It was all about, tell us about deals and tell us about Terminix. And at the very end of the, the session, the, the uh, journalist said, oh, is there anything I should have asked you? And I said, well, I said, you, perhaps you could have asked about the most recent deal we did in Israel and um, mentioned, you know, artificial intelligence for, for rats. And he said, what? What? Yeah. Tell me about that. And, you know, I told him a little bit. The story became front, line, uh, front page of the FT and the, and the weekend. And then Sky TV called up and wanted an interview. Uh, New it was York. in the Guardian. It was in, yeah, yeah it, was, it was. It was sort of everywhere. It's, it's like, it just sort of makes a point, really, that I think people are interested in the latest technology, and and people tend to think pest control is not very innovative. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of innovation going on in that space now. Whether you can monetize, you know, facial recognition for, for rodents. That's another debate for another day, but the fact that you can do it and it will tell you about rodent behavior, and we all say it's pest control, but pest prevention is far more important than pest control. If you, yep. can, if you can prevent the problem before it becomes an infestation by seeing early where the issue is and where it's coming from, then you're gonna be a better pest controller. So I think innovation is incredibly important, but some of it we do for a bit of a halo effect to, yeah. to be the innovator. Some of it we do um, really to come up with the solutions for the future. You have your innovation center here in the UK, and I understand yeah. you've got plans to build one in Texas. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we haven't quite announced it, but although we just no. have now in yeah. Dallas. Um, so we're, we're, Congratulations. We're, <laughs> thanks for that, Paul. Um, so, yeah, no, we're, we're, we're going to open an innovation center for residential of a termite. Um, based in Dallas, and then we're going to have an extension of that in Mobile, um, Alabama, for termite. And so what does the Innovation Center do? Is it a bunch of scientists tooling around with, you know, mix this together? Do, I mean, You've never been to one, have you, Paul? I'm I'm not, I can tell. You, should come, you should come to us. Malcolm invited me out this time around, and I just hadn't had the opportunity to do it. And I, I skipped the Innovation Center visits um, when Ronan was doing that back in... Uh, yeah. A lot of what we're doing is um, observing animal behavior. Okay. If you can understand the behavior of, in this case, the rodents, yeah, but it extends also to termite behavior, etc. If you were trying to work out what do they do, how do they, you know, if you can understand their habitat, understand where, where they live, what their patterns of behavior are, then you can start to anticipate in from a pest control or pest prevention point of view. So in the UK one, we have lots and lots of rats and yep. lots of mice, and we've got the largest collection of insects in Europe, and then we've got a mosquito room, we've got fly room, so you're testing every uh, ILT, insect-like trap, um, on the market. So we test our competitors' devices, we test our own innovation, so we're trying to make sure that we can stand behind the claims that we make um, from an efficacy point of view. Mm -hmm. It's where the regulatory team sign off that it meets all the regulatory um, standards and obligations. So yeah, we have, we have PhD scientists and technicians. In the one in the UK, we, we've, we've based that where we also do a lot of our frontline technician training. Okay. So we get the techs come in and they have great fun you know, learning, um, but they also tell our scientists, hey, you don't suppose you've got a solution for this, have you? And they, so we get some of the ideation coming from the front line. The front line pragmatists versus the... Yeah, that's all very interesting, but have you got something, yeah, you know, right. which, which is where tracking gel came from. One of the techs said, you know, we all go in there and we've got this blue light and we're checking. And we came up with this because one of the techs said, yeah. oh, why can't you come up with a, you know, like a tracking gel so we could see exactly where they've been, and just put, shine the light on it, that sort of thing. So, but it's, you know, I was in our tech center about four years ago and I was talking to the guy who was in charge of it. And he was incredibly excited. And he said, you won't believe this. We've, we've, we've he said, we've worked out that um, fleas are attracted to a certain um, spectrum of, of light and it, you know here's the spectrum and, the, and I'm like well it is impressive I said can you tell me how much work we do for flea control and I sort of <laughs> burst his bubble We're like no we don't really yeah there's not a market and so I have to be the 
you know, the miserable guy says, no, we're not doing that because we do, we'll only invest in things back to, you know, can it lower our costs or is it going to represent an exciting market opportunity? Mm -hmm. There's so many cool things that the scientists have come up with that we've said mm, that the market's not big enough for that. We, we won't make enough money. But so we have to have this very hard edge commercial side to decide what are we going to work on. But that will be the same idea in, in, in the new facility in, in the States, but we're going to focus there on resi and on termite. Okay. And so over here in, in the UK, we'll focus on the commercial side. And, Got it. And we'll keep the rodent center of excellence over here in the UK, and we'll be working more on flying, biting, crawling insects in, in the States. You know, it was interesting doing the Israeli transaction, but it, it made me start to think about how you guys grow around the world. You know, you've got pest control in your other business lines. It appears to me that you try to identify a country that, although it, it, it may be a little bit premature today, it's got some promise. Yeah. And you want to plant a flag there. Even if you, you know, I don't know, make up a small country out in the middle of nowhere, you buy a small business there, and now you've got rent -a kill and you can grow as the economy grows and develops. Is that kind of your philosophy? Or how do you identify yeah. markets? Yeah, no, it's, good. it's a good point. I mean, I mentioned earlier, we are in 93 countries. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's really two sorts of, maybe three, acquisitions we look for. Mm -hmm. Keep it simple to start with. First one is density building acquisitions in the cities. In the, And it's very much a city-based game. And it, you, mm -hmm. I shouldn't think in continents or countries, think in cities. When we went into Brazil, we went into the top three cities rather than trying to get you know, pan-Brazilian pan, uh, coverage. So the first one is, if it's a city we're already in, can we find nice bolt-ons? Because they give us density, yep. and that's wonderful. So that, that's, that's the easiest, if you like. Um, the second one, and you talked about planting flags, but so we have this thing called um, Cities of the Future, and we've worked out, guessed, worked out, not sure, which of the cities are going to be mega cities yep. in 2050? Which are the countries that we think are going to have differential growth? But within the countries, which are the cities that we think are going to have differential growth? Because I, because I pretty much can guarantee, if you can show me a country with really good GDP growth, I can show you cities will be growing faster than the average GDP, and I can show you that pest control within those cities will be growing faster than the city GDP. So you've got real opportunity for growth. So for those countries, we've got the list of the cities that we want to go after. Okay. Now within those cities, can we find the best pest control company or the second or the third best, but not the 50th best? Right. Can we find someone who's really, really good that's got that local reputation? They've probably been doing it for a few decades. If we can win that, we probably then change it to uh, uh, rent -a kill brand name. Mm -hmm. And then we go back to category one. Let's, okay, now we've got the, the first one. Can we get the second and the third and the fourth within that area? Because now we've got density. If we're right, we won't be right every time. By 2050, mm -hmm. we're going to have an incredibly profitable and very dense set of operations in a bunch of cities that frankly in 2050 will be very well known because they're mega cities, whereas today they're not quite as, as well known, which means it takes us into some territories that some other people will feel a little bit, a little bit more queasy. We've just gone into Pakistan. I used to run my old business in my old company in Pakistan. I know the country well. Pakistan as a market is not for the faint-hearted. You know, we've gone into Lebanon yeah. and we've gone into Argentina and some of these will not be instantly successful overnight. But if we get that densification, urbanization, fast GDP growth and, and build up uh, over time, I think, you know, those will be incredibly exciting opportunities. And that's what we're doing around the world. But you've got to weather some storms. I mean, I think you guys closed the Boker acquisition immediately prior to the government issues in Lebanon, you know, lights turning off and... Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and look, some of the markets, you, you could... There'll always be a reason for not doing it. Yeah. I mean, Argentina, I've been looking at Argentina for you know, 15 years, and I'm oh, not sure, not sure, not yeah. sure, and we've gone in, and because now it's looking a bit, yeah, but it'll be all right. Yeah. It'll be all right. If you, if you take your time horizon out to you know, 2050, 
these will be you know, successful. And even, even if a few are not successful, and the majority are, the value creation opportunity on the majority dwarfs the one or two that are not successful. So you have to be, you know, you have to be prepared to accept that you're not going to roll six sixes, as my old boss used to say. You're never going to get it right all of the time. But, but if you're so concerned about the downside, you'll never make any progress there at all. So I think that that's the approach we've we've taken, and I think. We can only be judged on that one in about 10 or 20 years' time, not in the next you know, six or 12 months. But I, I actually think that will be um, incredibly exciting. And, and again, it, these are markets, not every time, but, but very often these are markets where <laughs> there's less competition yeah. down there. So we wouldn't see too many people knocking on the doors in Pakistan when we were down there in terms of our normal competitors. Yeah. Um, which, which I think is also interesting as well. So it gives us, you know, it gives us some opportunity to build scale in those markets, perhaps a little bit more easily than in the markets where we're butting up against the Absolutely. usual you know, characters. You know, being a publicly traded company, oftentimes executive management's focused on the near term. You know, it makes a lot more sense in the near term today to go out and do incremental deals and cities, you know, the add-on, mm. the density plays, right? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas here at Renekel, I mean, you guys are clearly doing those, but you're also saying, okay, let's look out 10, 15, 20, 30 years yeah. and start to plant these seeds now, which I don't see many others doing. Yeah. And look, I mean, I've, I've only done two jobs in my, I did 20 years at the last company, I've done 15 years so far uh, at this one. So I, I'm a long-term, I'm a long-term thinker. Unfortunately, you're PLC or a public company, you've got to do both. Yeah. You got to do both because if 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 all you're doing is the short term stuff, then one day that might run out. Yeah. So you better be better been thinking on the medium and the long term. So I think it is important that you you do the both do both of them. I'd be interesting if you know if I'm fortunate enough to have another you know 20 30 years on the planet and I look back at my time at Rentico, I I wouldn't be surprised if the thing that the biggest achievement will actually be the global footprint that we will have built and the technology that we will have built as much as the positions in the existing markets that we've built today. So I, th I think you, know, you, need, you need both. As you enter new markets, is pest control always the edge of the wedge or are you also looking on, you know, sometimes you enter on a hygiene side? Most of the time it's pest. Um, you know, I've told you before, I mean, I'm, I'm on, on a mission to convince the stock markets that our hygiene business should be valued at a similar rating to the pest control. Mm -hmm. um, but they lead, the lead entry in nearly all of our, our markets has been pest, Occasion, occasionally hygiene, but hygiene with pest on the side sometimes as opposed to pest with hygiene on the side, but it's nearly always pest. So, I mean, how big is hygiene? As from a market perspective versus pest in, in typical from a global market, yeah, it's, it's almost impossible to answer that question because pest you can it's an industry and you can yeah. say was well, hygiene is such a broad church Correct. it covers so many things I mean you, you wouldn't know that we have a we have a dental hygiene business that that um, you know that tube you put in your mouth and all the rubbish that comes and goes down the tube and well that goes into a machine in a filter and we provide the filters and then we take the filter and we reprocess the gunk to get the precious metals back out of, of that and then we get gold and palladium and all that. You wouldn't imagine that's a business that we're in. No. It's a business that we're in. Um, when the gold price is high we make out yeah. very well, when it's low we don't do so well. So we've got lots and lots of adjuncts to hygiene, so it makes it really quite difficult to answer the question, how big is the market? But what you see in, in hygiene is a very, very fragmented market. You don't see, you've got Sintas in the States, mm -hmm. you've got CWS Boco in Europe, but you don't have many big, big players other than us, um, and which is kind of what makes it exciting. And in a post-pandemic world, this is a world where we are more concerned about hygiene, whether it's air hygiene, surface hygiene. Uh, it, it is an opportunity. So we're, you know, we're putting a lot of effort in there. We've not spent as much in the M&A space uh, by, by a long way as, as we have in pest control. But there is an opportunity to continue to build that. And there's, would you say there's as much opportunity in hygiene from an acquisition perspective as there is in pest? Is that, is that you asking as a broker or is, or is that... Um... that way, I'm just, I'm curious because, you know, the, the analysts talk about this all the time, right? And I actually get these questions and I don't know anything about hygiene, but, you know, they ask me. Yeah, like, like I, oh, what's I, the, you know, Andy's always talking about it being the new pest. What is this? How does it work? It, it, it's hard work to build 
through acquisition just because there aren't many medium-sized players. Yeah. There's, there's a gazillion small players. Yeah. There isn't a town or, or a city in the world, in the, in the developed world, that doesn't have a high yeah. number of hygiene yeah. players. But it means it's a very slow process. You know, you'd have to buy buy city, uh, and and you know, if you could find a, a, a national player, then that would make things go a lot faster. But we, to be honest, we've been much more selective going after pest, and then side of plate. Yeah, there's a nice hygiene. There's a nice hygiene mm-hmm. one. But as I said earlier, if if we do slow things a little bit in uh, 23, 24 in pest control United States, it means we will push a bit harder on the hygiene opportunity um, outside of the States over the next few years. So there's, a, there's an opportunity for sure. Renekill shed some service lines over the years. Do you, you know, outside of pest and hygiene, do you folks spend any time internally talking about like, hey, maybe we should get into this, maybe we should get into that? You know, you, you think about like Orkin running lawn care in the U.S. for yeah. example. It's a small amount, but you know, Terminex of course was an amalgamation of a bunch of things under Service Master. What we would look for and what we do look for is it's got to be a route-based density business. It's got to be a business that has um, a regulatory requirement. The wonderful thing about pest control in certainly commercial environments is if you don't have pest control, you can lose your license or you can be prosecuted, etc. So there's a regulatory component, a density component. It's got to have some barrier to entry. Yeah. I mean, zero barriers to entry. Lawn, I think, is a zero bar- zero barrier to entry uh, example. So there are some in 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 the sort of close by spaces. And you gave a couple of examples. Um, you know, Vector isn't pure play pest control, um, but is a is a nice contiguous space. You know, um, weed management, lake that management. sort of thing. Lake management is another one. So yeah, we were always looking and, and scoping. It's easier to see what those areas are in hygiene than it is in pest control. Um, but yeah, we've we've got a few um, irons and a few fires. Yeah. When you look around the world now, we've got some potential dark clouds on the horizon from an economic perspective, right? You know, yeah. Interest rates ratcheting up. You've got. Well, we've all watched the news about what's going on here in recent yeah. months in the UK. Yeah. What sort of you know, clearly pest and hygiene are extremely recession resilient, and you were around back in the great financial crisis. Yeah. I mean, I think Renekill has done a great job. I remember when COVID came out, you guys got out in front of this very, yeah. very quick. What sort of conversations do you have with your team about what might be coming down the pike from an economic perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it is interesting. COVID is not a bad example of, of you. In a global business, you can see the impacts, in some cases, happening before they've happened in your backyard. So in COVID, we could see China and Hong Kong and Taiwan. And that was one of the reasons we were able to pivot so quickly, because they said, everyone's going around in white suits, yep. you know, spraying disinfection. OK, right, that, that means we can think about that. Um, in terms of, in terms of um, you know, recession, I think jury's out on that one as, as well as the whether whether we're actually going to have recession. I don't think we're going to have a broad-based deep recession in the way that people were concerned about 12 months ago. Even in this country, which I would say of all of my 93, this is the toughest economic. Yep. This is why you got mugged the other yeah. day. It's, it's tough out here at the moment. Yeah, it was a former it was a, a teacher who <laughs> was out of work. She, yeah. So I, I, even here, I don't I don't think we're necessarily headed for recession. And you know what the stock market's like, if you think about it from a stock market point of view, the stock market will be the first to see past these economic conditions. So the stock market's already beginning to think, hmm, maybe we're seeing, seeing, calling the end of this, calling the, you know, our, our interests. Sorry, chaps. Can I get you anything else to drink? It's been an end of a long day, Andy. Why don't we have a pint? <laughs> if you're buying. Um, I'm buying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that'd be nice. Pint times two? Yeah. Yes. Brilliant. I'll bring them over. Fantastic. Thank Thanks. Um, yeah, so, so as, we, as we look, I'd say the North American economy is holding up. Um, you know, conditions are tougher, but it's holding up pretty well. Um, Europe, Germany's wobbling. Uh, France is holding up better um, than people expected. Even the UK, I think, is, is, you know, you can begin to see that maybe we're seeing past this. I think, you know, the, the um, rates of inflation are falling. Interest rates are probably close to their peak. They may go up a little bit more. So 
we have to work out how to trade through that for the next probably 12 months. And then, then you know what happens on the other side. There will be a rebound. Yeah. So I think for us, you know, we haven't, we haven't, the, the, the danger, I think, is to, is to fall into the trap of, of suddenly switching into, uh, you know, yeah. is, bad down the hatches. Is, is exactly. And, and so you don't want to, I don't think you want to do that. You want to be able to trade through it. I said we were the original, Pest is the original subscription business. We've taken the position on price that, that we will try to recover input cost inflation through price. Mm-hmm. Not to gain an advantage on our customers, but to recover our input cost inflation. And as we see those input costs beginning to abate, then our position on pricing will abate accordingly. But the last 12, 18 months, we've done a very, very good job on recovering input cost inflation. And you, uh, I think you can see that you know, beginning to, to come off a little bit. So I'm, I, I'm supposed I'm on the bullish side of, of yeah. where the economy is going. Not because I think the next 12 months are going to be particularly easy. I don't think they will be. But I think life after that, you can begin to see where the recovery comes from. So our view is, is don't, you know, don't start cutting down to the muscle. Don't yep. start, you know. And I've seen other companies that they back off on things like training. Yep. We, we never backed off on training, even in after 2008. You always invest in people and always invest in the growth side of the business. But you just have to be a little bit more a bit smarter about where you where you put your capital to work in the in recessionary times but i'm reasonably bullish if i'm honest yeah switching topics here to something more interesting you know i i wrote that note about your taylor swift uh swifty thing. did you read that little poem that little sonnet i i i read everything that you put out <laughs> chips cheers <laughs> of moon law thank you joe excellent enjoy those thank you very much cheers paul cheers andy yeah so, I don't know if Brett's really a Swifty or he was saying that to try to be cool. I'm, you had already I'm not sure. I'm going to get sure I'm making myself look cool. Let's be very, very clear. My kids think this is madness. <laughs> so, how'd this all come about? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I do listen to a lot of music. And um, normally when I go to the gym and I just put stuff that I like on and then... Yeah. And, I guess I've, I'm, I've always quite liked Taylor Swift going back, you know, all those years when she when she was country and all the rest of it. But I had this 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 shocking statistic during lockdown one. I got the thing from Spotify, and, and it said at the end of the year that I was in the top zero point five percent of uh, Swifters. You know, people listening to Taylor Swift. You beat out millions of teenage girls. Right, exactly, planet, right? exactly. Which is which is a tragic thought. And then the and then twelve months later, <laughs> they sent me another email saying I was now in the top zero point two five. I'm in the top quarter, which is um, really really is tragic. I, t- I took my daughter. Um, to uh, Wembley, you know, uh, football stadium yep. when Taylor Swift played uh, three years ago. And I remember I went to the Gents, I went to the urinals, and the, the urinals in Wembley is, is huge. I mean, it goes on, wow. it's a wall of, I was the only person in the Gents. I mean, basically there were not many middle-aged men, you know, with prostate conditions, uh, you know, going to a Taylor Swift concert, I mean, but, yeah. No, I just, I, you know, what can I say? I've, 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 I've loved her for Security years. Security didn't pick you up and say, what are you doing here, buddy? <laughs> well, it was worse than that, because I actually took a photo of it to post it to my family and say, look, how sad is this? I'm the only bloke at the concert. I, I don't know what I can tell you, really. It's um, it's strange. She comes from Reading, Pennsylvania, which, of course, is where uh, uh, Rentacle comes from. Ehrlich. Yeah. Ehrlich land. So, um, yeah, that's, I can't make that as an excuse. But, no, you, yeah. you can't. But How's I'll the beer, take, by I'll take it today. It's fantastic. And speaking of the beer, this is, what do you call this, Guy Ritchie's Boozer? This is Guy Ritchie's Boozer. Yeah. The great Guy Ritchie. I'd never heard the term boozer until this morning. Is that right? It was first time, yeah. Yeah, I don't know where you've been then. No, I guess I've stayed away from the booze. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know who Guy Ritchie is, right? Indeed, I can't understand any, any of his films. I don't know what people are talking about. Exactly, yeah. then you've understood them. Gypsies. What are you doing, Potter? Get out the way back. I can't really understand much of what is being said. You tell me. They are proper um, sort of East End villain type movies, and, and we love them. What's your favourite Guy Ritchie film? Um, probably Lock Stock. Lock Stock, Two Smacking Barrels. Outstanding film, but I, you know, I do love The Gentleman, which is the, which is the most recent of his big movies, so I'm not sure. I mean, 
health warning. The language in that film is pretty shocking, but um, I do love it. He's some, um, yeah, so he's, he's quite the character. He was married to uh, your very own Madonna. You must be my lucky star. He lived in, uh, in, well, not so far from here, but yeah, no, he's, he's a very cool character. And just been talking to the barman who said he does come in here yeah. from time to time, so. I'm waiting any minute now for him for to join us, Paul. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> I, I, we might have a better chance of getting Taylor Swift in here. Well, you could do that as well. You could do that as well. And if you can get me a couple of tickets, um, I'm sure with your, with, your, with your contacts, but... See what we can do. There we go. Well, Andy, it's been great catching up with you. It's always good to see you, Bob. Yeah, it's been really good. I've enjoyed it. So, um, glad you're having time and a uh, good time in London, apart from getting uh, mugged. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. We'll just do it again with the film in this time. <laughs> <laughs>